Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story. I used my solution to the problem because they didn't want to listen to me. The second story. Management isn't interested in solving problems, opting instead to play guessing games with my nerves. The third story. Don't threaten me with your empty statements. And the first story is... Why do you hire an expert if you don't want to listen to him? I used to work in a technical service business to consumer company. I just transferred from my old company to my new company because of my expertise in phone number portability. My new company used a different system to perform that task than my old company, but I already had a pretty well idea of how things could be organized since I had some experience already, even though I moved from the mobile market to the landline market. I needed to reduce the FTE in the process of incoming new customers and leaving customers from about 60 FTE, working on that process over different regions to whatever I could. Also, about the time I came into the company, the company was going through a big reconciliation process, since it consisted of merger onto merger onto merger of different companies with all different CRMs, network provisioning, network management systems, and so on. The only thing they were not able to integrate was the system that would meet the regulatory required number portability process, we were consistently not meeting lawful requirements, and even were penalized for not meeting these requirements. Hence, here I am. I already have a functional architecture in my head, drawn up during my previous job, where it was deemed not feasible, which I heavily contested. My idea was that the process was initiated with an order through a CRM application, supported by billing systems, provisioning systems, the IN, and thus the HLRs, Intelligent Network and Home Location Register, for all non-telco readers, which are key components in this process chain. That basic process architecture was under development. However, without all the exceptions of the number portability process, which I handed them on a gold platter. Unfortunately, I was hired about one month late, since the design had already been approved and didn't any integration of phone number portability, which was at that moment about 90% of customer growth. So the developers came up with a genius design to create something that was called need to do. That is not the real name of the object, but if I mention the real name, some people might get an idea which company, especially when I mention the bottleneck later on. Every action that one of the agents working on number portability had to perform was marked by such a need to do notification, which would be put into a queue. And there were many steps in process, combined with the exponential growth of the number of new customers. The need to do tasks were just simply too much to keep track of. Since for every new customer, there would be about eight new tasks, and we would get in on the heydays about 20,000 new customers a month. However, all those agents previously were working on a standalone system for that process, so their focus was on that system, because there was where the real workload was. I could confirm that, since in my previous company, I missed about 12,000 orders, due to faulty registration, and relying on a paper trail instead of computers. So our CRM system, which was also our main order entry systems, soon got flooded with those need to do tasks, which were some kind of mini trouble tickets with lawfully assigned resolution times. Needless to say that matching orders with customers was difficult, but these need to do tickets were creating increasing alarms since they went overdue, for which I warned the design team already. So my assignment was to clear the more than 1 million items of backlog in items, which I did, and here comes the malicious compliance. So I requested the items to be closed in batch, which I knew could be done, since I had seen the database. I had seen the tables they were in, and I had seen there was a label called status, which could be updated in a single update status. That was not possible, I was told. I even executed the script I had written myself on a test environment, and surprise, surprise, it worked. But no is no, so I went about searching for another solution which I found. Closing each task, thus removing it from the system, and removing the alarms that were flooding the system meant opening each item, clicking on closed, click on next, and go into the queue to open the next item, for which we had no staff. Since the amount of backlog already accumulated over 1 million items, and we actually didn't have enough staff to perform the day-to-day -day requests of number portability. So I used another solution, an automated mouse clicker, mouse tamer for the early 2000 geeks, to do that task. I would arrive around 7 a.m. at work, turn on about six desktops of my colleagues initiated mouse tamer, and I had some coffee. My colleagues knew what I was doing, so they let my scripts run for as long as they possibly could before initiating their job. Unfortunately, some really genius of an architect decided that all system actions had to be executed and queued through one single table. 
Let's call the table Exploding Table, which is actually not far from the real name of that table, which didn't have a destructive read. And every closure of one single need to do item created six entries into that table. In the beginning, my solution worked like a charm. However, with the regular amount of orders and also very simple actions would fill up that table with anywhere between four to 10 new items. After about two weeks into my cleanup project, about 10 a.m., our CRM would die, wouldn't be available for at least about three hours. And over the next week every day, it died about five minutes earlier every day, and the outage lasted longer. Finally, it was discovered that the exploding table was overflowing with all my actions I initiated before 8 a.m. when business opened. After discovering the issue, I had to stop doing what I was doing, even though I was threatened to be held accountable for the backlog in need to do tickets, not requested by me, even to which I advised against. I could proof that by email. So I told them that either the next release they could close my need to do tickets in batch, or I would continue executing my job. They choose for the first option using my script, and I even wasn't a DBA. The second story is, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. A Couple of years ago, I was working as a sole SME, subject matter expert for a small company, and it was awesome. I had a great time bringing them into the new millennium. It was real bad, had good relations with everyone, and the company in general made it a point to be good to its employees. My work spoke for itself. The department I was assigned to started turning a profit for the first time in company history. Not that hard when you actually know what you're doing. Management saw dollar signs and went on to articulate a bunch of different ideas on how to best evolve and continue this recent trend of successes. Maybe I was too expensive. Maybe I had pushed back on too many a dumb idea. Maybe they thought they could do without me since things were no longer on fire. In any case, they felt they needed to get rid of me and decided that instead of having a conversation, the solution would be to simply frustrate me to no end until I'd eventually quit of my own volition. I would later find out they had done this to other employees before. So they started exploiting the pride I have in the quality of my work. Every other week, management would tell me that business unit was complaining about me, then refused to answer any questions or elaborate any further. The strategy worked, as this frustrated me greatly, until one fateful day when I was pulled into a meeting. It was about an unrelated topic, but of course they had to mention once more that business unit was complaining. You're denying me and all information about this nebulous complaint. What the hell do you expect me to do? Answer, I want you to talk to head of business unit. For God's sake, can't you solve problems by yourself? So I decided that's what I was gonna do and sat down the next day to type out the following message. Dear head of business unit, I was told yesterday for the sixth time that business unit was complaining about me. For the sixth time, I asked for details, elementary things like the subject of complaint. And for the sixth time, any and all information was categorically denied to me. I do not know why management isn't interested in solving problems opting instead to playing guessing games with my nerves. In any case, as one apparently can no longer expect information to be passed on, I warmly recommended that you take up any and all issues directly with me. This way, I'll be able to ensure that they're not only taken seriously, but also actually handled. Best regards, my name. P.S. With the writing of this message, I consider the matter closed, until such a time as someone providing me with an actual subject of complaint. With the management CC'd, it didn't take long for them to pull me into a meeting room and voice their displeasure. But since I had done nothing but present facts, there was nothing they could accuse me of, apart from showcasing their own SH behavior. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. They did finally find the backbone to tell me I should seek employment elsewhere, and I moved on to greener pastures. Until today, I can only speculate on why they chose to poison the relationship, instead of just asking me to find new employment and letting me leave on good terms. Oh yeah, and my department, it folded the following year. The last story is, you have to stay with these kids. Call your boss. Hi, medical professional here. The other night I had my second bigger blowout malicious compliance. The story started with us getting dispatched to a motor vehicle accident with two minors. The problem with treating minors is that after treatment has been rendered, even if they only have minor injuries, you cannot let them refuse transport due to them being minors. They don't have the legal capacity to refuse transport. I explained this to them and they were fine with it. Their parents were out of town and probably about five hours away. They were able to call their parents on a passerby's phone, but lost their phones in the accident. So as of now, we have no way to contact their parents. I had the option of going to one of two hospitals. They were equally distant apart from us and about 30 minutes apart from each other. A pediatric ER, which was not close to the patient's closest family member or the general hospital that was close to their house. It didn't matter to me, and I gave our patient the options. Essentially, the kids needed to be babysat until guardians arrive. PD will not take custody, 
and an ambulance we're also not babysitting, until parents arrive. But as they have minor injuries, that isn't for us to decide. We can also only take people from the scene to the hospital. A general ER is able to put chairs out and wait for parents to arrive. So we get to the hospital and get inside. The kids walk since they were really fine. We register the patient and the charge nurse is starting to talk to us. He asks if their parents are going to be here soon and we explain the situation. This is when it turns bad. The charge nurse starts quizzing us. Well, why did you take them then? I explain we legally cannot let them refuse. The charge nurse starts making snide comments like, what do you expect us to do? After a few, he says you're going to have to stay with them because we're not taking responsibility for them. At this point, I inform them that this isn't how it works and we're not staying with the children. They have resources to handle said children and we're an ambulance. I got resistance and we start to get into an argument. The charge nurse says, so you're gonna just pick up these kids and dump them on us. That's not going to happen. That's not right. We literally have no choice in the matter. We cannot legally leave them on the side of a highway, put them in a chair and let them wait. So the ER doctor agrees with them and joins the fight. Finally, the doctor and nurse say in the nastiest tone to call your boss. Now, I would have just left it at that if they just shut up. The problem with calling my boss is that one, he's going to make it into a big to-do, and two, he's probably asleep at this point, so I'm going to wake him up for BS. A bigger to-do means that we're going to have formal complaints against them at the hospital. Something that they really do not want is the way they're acting us uncalled for and extremely unprofessional. I'm also a supervisor, so I don't need to go up higher in the chain, but since it's going to cause problems for them, I decided to. So I call my boss who backs me 100%. I offer to allow them to talk to him. I explain everything and I get nasty faces from the doctor who puts his hand up and near me as a sign of no. Then the charge nurse who tells me that he doesn't want to talk to him, that's fine. So the charge nurse says first initial last name, I'll remember your name and I'll remember this, which fuels my fire more. Now at this point, I could have dropped it, but they didn't let it go, so I'm not going to. I ask for his full name, his title, his position, etc. He's reluctant to give it, but I do get it. Finally, we're at the point where we're looking for patient signatures for billing. Our patients are minors and legally can't sign, so hospital staff signs in place of them and so do we. The charge nurse initially refuses to sign and that's fine. It's just a billing signature and something that would probably fuel the incident more. But after about 10 seconds, he comes back and decides that he'll sign. In his head, he probably thought this was a transfer of care signature, which could be a problem if he's refusing to sign, but it wasn't. My guess is this is where he knew he effed up. At that end, we're walking out and he comes to me and says, I need your name and the number to call your boss too. Be my guess. I'm supervisor, first name, last name, and this is my boss's contact information. Then he goes, I only need this because the attitude started with you. Mind you, the whole time I'm calm and collected. We get back and I have my partner write a statement and I wrote my own. I also didn't mention I'm friends with another ER doctor and know the hospital director as well. Oops. Please don't threaten me with your empty statements. I'm gonna remember this. What are you gonna do? Punish the patients I bring in because you don't like me? Let's maintain professionalism at all times. It's a formal complaint now against you and we could have dropped it. Instead, you wanted me to call my boss. Instead, you did a backhand threat. Instead, you tried to cause problems for me instead. I'm taking this as far as I can go now. I hope you love these stories. Subscribe, hit the like button and turn on notifications.